Eric Edgar Cook, February 25, 1931, October 26, 1964, dubbed the Night Caller and subsequently the Netherlands Monster, was a serial murderer from Australia. He terrorized Perth from September 1958 to August 1963 by committing at least 22 violent crimes, eight of which ended in death. Cook was born in Victoria Park, a suburb of Perth, Western Australia, on February 25, 1931, and was the oldest of three children. He was born into an unpleasant island household. His parents married primarily to protect his mother, Christine Cook, and his alcoholic father, Vivian Cook, often beat him, particularly when the child attempted to defend his mother. Christine Cook slept in the staff room at her Como Hotel employment to escape being beaten. Cook was born with a cleft lip and palate, for which he had two operations at the ages of 3 and 12 months. He had a minor facial abnormality and spoke in a mumble as a result of unsuccessful surgical procedures to correct the abnormalities, these handicaps made him the focus of abuse at school. Cook's disfigurements also made him embarrassed, timid, and emotionally unstable at an early age, as a result of the resulting beatings and bullying. Though Cook excelled in areas requiring retentive memory and physical dexterity, he was dismissed from Subiaco State School at the age of six for stealing money from a teacher's purse. Cook was once again the brunt of numerous jokes when he was moved to Newcastle Street Infant School due to his mumble and scar. He continued to be mocked at each of his schools, including Highgate Primary School, Forest Street Primary School, and Newcastle Street Junior Technical School. On occasion, Cook was also put in orphanages or foster homes. Cook, like his mother, would conceal himself under the home or wander the nearby streets in order to avoid a night of his father's wrath. Cook was often hospitalized for head injuries and was suspected of having suffered brain damage as a result of his accident-prone nature. Later on, it was questioned if this was as a result of suppressed suicidal inclinations. Additionally, he suffered from recurring headaches and was briefly sent to a mental institution. His alleged blackout ceased after a surgery in 1949. He dropped out of school at the age of 14 in order to work as a delivery boy for central provision stores and help support his family. He would donate his weekly earnings to his mother, who was unable to maintain the family entirely on the income she made cooking and cleaning. Cook was hospitalized on a number of occasions as a result of his accident-prone nature. Cook was hospitalized after being hit in the nose by a winch while working for Harris, Scarf, and Sandover. He worked as a hammer boy in the blacksmith department of the Midland Junction factory at the age of 16, where he always marked his lunch bag Al Capone. He ended up scorching his face with steam and sustaining second-degree burns, jarring his right hand and injuring his left thumb while doing the same task. Beginning at the age of 17, Cook spent his evenings doing minor crimes and vandalism. He would eventually serve an 18-month prison sentence for torching a church after his rejection in a choir audition. Cook would sneak into homes and take anything he deemed important throughout his late adolescent years. These offenses progressed to vandalizing clothes and furnishings in a fit of rage. He would rip out newspaper articles of his misdeeds in an effort to impress his acquaintances and make pals. On March 12, 1949, at Cook's grandmother's house, police apprehended the juvenile vandal after discovering evidence at his home. His fingerprints were then compared to those discovered in other active investigations. Cook was sentenced to three years in jail on May 24, 1949, at the age of 18, after being caught for arson and vandalism by Detective Burroughs, who deemed the youngster one of life's unfortunates. He was convicted of two counts of theft, seven counts of break and enter, and four counts of arson. He left many fingerprints and obvious evidence for police, teaching him to be more circumspect in future crimes. Cook was characterized as a slim, lanky guy with dark, wavy hair and a twisted lips. Cook enlisted in the regular Australian Army at the age of 21, but was dismissed three months later when it was found that he had a juvenile record for stealing, breaking and entering, and arson prior to enrollment. He was soon promoted to Lance Corporal and taught how to handle weapons throughout his training. Cook married Sarah, Sally, Lavin, a 19-year-old waitress, in the Cannington Methodist Church on Saturday, November 14, 1953, when he was 22 years old, demolished 1995. They eventually produced a big family of seven children consisting of four boys and three girls. Throughout the 1950s and early 1960s, Australians often left their vehicles unsecured, and frequently with the keys in the ignition. Cook was adept at stealing automobiles at night and sometimes returned stolen vehicles to their owners without the owners being aware of the crime. Cook was sentenced to two years hard prison in September 1955 after colliding with a car and needing hospitalization. He was eventually freed from Fremantle Prison just before Christmas 1956. Following his release, he began wearing women's gloves when committing crimes in order to avoid leaving fingerprints, 
which had been his downfall in previous breaking and entering cases. Cook's four-year murder spree included a series of apparently unconnected hit and runs, stabbings, strangulations, and shootings. Victims were shot several times with various weapons, attacked with knives and scissors, run over by vehicles, and beaten with an axe. Several were murdered when they awoke to find Cook plundering their houses, two were shot while sleeping in their homes unnoticed, and one was shot dead after answering a knock on the door. Cook retrieved lemonade from the refrigerator and sat on the porch sipping it after stabbing one victim. Cook strangled one victim to death with a cord from a bedroom lamp, then indecently assaulted, disrobed, and dragged the body to a neighbor's yard, where he indecently penetrated it with an empty whiskey bottle cradled in the victim's arms. Pina, Penny, Berkman, Gillian McPherson Brewer, John Lindsay Sturkey, George Orman Wamsley, Rosemary Anderson, Constance Lucy Madrill, and Shirley Martha McLeod were also among Cook's murder victims. Another victim, Brian Weir, died three years after being shot by Cook as a consequence of lifelong damage. Due to the fact that the crimes were opportunistic and used a variety of techniques, and Cook's victims lacked apparent similarities, it was not recognized that all of these murders were committed by a single person. Indeed, two of the killings were ascribed to different individuals who were unjustly convicted in connection with Gillian Brewer and Rosemary Anderson's deaths. Over 30,000 men over the age of 12 were fingerprinted, and over 60,000.22 rifles were located and tested. In August 1963, a firearm was discovered concealed in a Geraldton wax bush on Rookwood Street, Mount Pleasant. Ballistic testing determined that the weapon had been used in the McLeod murder. Police returned to the scene and attached a similar gun, made useless, to the bush using a fishing line, constructing a hide in which they waited in case the weapon was recovered. Cook was seen loitering in a vehicle in the vicinity many times and was arrested shortly after midnight on 1st of September when he attempted to retrieve the firearm. Cook ultimately confessed to his many crimes, including eight killings and 14 attempted murders, after initial denials about the McLeod murder. He was convicted of killing Sturkey, one of five victims of Cook's Australia Day shootings. Cook showed an extraordinary recall for the specifics of his crimes in his confessions, regardless of how long ago he committed the offenses. For instance, he confessed to over 250 burglaries and was able to describe precisely what he stole, including the quantity and value of coins taken from each site. Brit Christian's book Presumed Guilty contains details of Cook's confession to his legal aid counsel Desmond Heenan during two days in September 1963 at Fremantle Prison. I have a high regard for the law, despite the fact that my actions do not reflect this, Cook said. Cook entered a not guilty plea claiming insanity. Cook's attorneys claimed throughout the trial that he had schizophrenia, but this claim was rejected when the head of the state's mental health services testified that he was sane. The authorities would not allow Cook to be examined by independent mental experts. Cook was convicted of intentional murder on November 28, 1963 after a three-day jury trial in Western Australia's Supreme Court before Justice Virtue. He was condemned to death by hanging and, despite the fact that he had grounds to appeal, he directed his attorneys not to file an appeal, saying that he deserved to pay for his actions. Cook was hanged at Fremantle Prison at 8 a.m. on October 26, 1964, after serving 13 months in New Division. Cook swore on the Bible five minutes before his sentence was carried out that he murdered Brewer and Anderson, allegations that had previously been dismissed due to the fact that other individuals had already been convicted of those crimes. Cook was the state of Western Australia's final person to be hanged. He was laid to rest in Fremantle Cemetery, beside the bones of child murderer Martha Rendell, who was executed at Fremantle Prison in 1909. Two of Cook's assassinations resulted in wrongful convictions. Daryl Beamish, a deaf mute, was convicted in December 1961 of the 1959 murder of Gillian McPherson Brewer, a Melbourne heiress who was slashed with scissors and beaten with a hatchet. Beamish was originally condemned to death, but his sentence was reduced to life in prison, and a further inquiry, aided by Post newspaper's owner Brett Christian, resulted in his conviction being reversed. Beamish's first appeal was denied due to the court's disbelief in Cook's testimony. Cook's admissions were seen by the prosecution as an effort to prolong his own trial, and Sir Albert Wolfe, then Chief Justice of Western Australia, described Cook as a villainous unscrupulous liar. Christian's book Presumed Guilty details the police case against Beamish. John Button was wrongfully convicted in the murder of his lover, Rosemary Anderson, who died at 2.30 a.m. on February 10, 1963 at the Royal Perth Hospital, RPH. Anderson had spent the previous day with Button in celebration of his 19th birthday, that night, they had a small disagreement, which ended in her leaving the Button residence and walking home. At various points, Button followed her in his vehicle, trying to get her to take a ride home. 
Button stopped his vehicle at one point to have a cigarette. Upon continuing driving, he drove onto Stubbs Terrace in Shenton Park and found her lying on the roadside. John Button brought his wounded girlfriend to a local doctor, who then transported her to RPH by ambulance. The police got involved and questioned Button, who broke down and admitted to being guilty for Anderson's hit and run death after intensive interrogation and upon learning of her death. Following Cook's conviction for manslaughter, the courts dismissed Button's initial appeal, despite the fact that Cook had confessed to the crime and provided details that only the perpetrator could have known, in particular, the judges did not believe Cook's claim that Anderson's body was thrown over the roof of a Holdenex sedan without damaging the external windscreen sun visor. Over the subsequent decades, Button and his supporters, including Christian and Blackburn, continued to press for a retrial, culminating in a well-publicized 1998 simulated reenactment of Anderson's death, conducted by crash test experts, using a Holden matching the one believed to have been driven by Cook on the night in question, as well as three Simca Arone sedans similar to the one owned by Button. As Cook stated, the dummy was flung over the Holden's roof, and the damage suffered matched the records of a panel-beating company that had repaired the car driven by Cook in 1963. The scientists discovered that when struck by a person, the sun visor bent and restored to its original form without breaking the paint. A U.S. expert was sent to Australia to establish that Cook's vehicle, not Button's, struck Anderson. Despite Cook's 1963 confession, Beamish was sentenced to 15 years and served five, while Button was sentenced to 10 years and served five. The Court of Criminal Appeal reversed Button's conviction in 2002. Button's victory paved the path for Beamish's appeal when he was acquitted in 2005. In both instances, the appellate judges determined that Cook was almost certainly responsible for the killings. On June 2, 2011, the Western Australian government awarded Beamish an ex-gratia payment of 425,000 Australian dollars.